Nigerians marked the 60th anniversary of the attainment of independence from Britain. Likely to be a lot of sober reflection against the backdrop of the impact of COVID-19 on the country. There is also a growing number of Nigerians who believe that the country is at a crossroads and at a point where certain critical decisions need to be made regarding which direction to go, hopefully for the next 60 years. Joining us now to cast an expert eye on this subject is Professor Patu Tome, founder Center for Values in Leadership, a professor of political economy, a management expert, a fellow of the Institute of Management Consultants of Nigeria, and a former presidential candidate. Good morning, Prof. Thank you for joining us on this special location on The Morning Show. Good morning. I'm Good morning. glad to join you. I hope, I wish I had a green tie, but unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Well, quickly, let's start with uh, the president's uh, broadcast this morning. Uh, we have tried to uh, make sense of uh, some of the issues in that uh, broadcast. But I would like to draw your attention to paragraph 9 of that uh, speech, where the president asks, where did we do the right things? That's one. Are we on course? If not, where did we stray? And how can we remedy the situation? These are key questions uh, that uh, the president uh, started with. He tried to provide answers, uh, but there are questions that all of us can also reflect upon, as he has requested. Okay, um, I, I didn't hear you all through because I just a slight break, but I, I, I think I get the import of the question about where the rain started beating us. Yes. What did we get right? What did we not manage to do as we should have done? Um, I think to start with, the business of nation building is not um, a straight line graph. Uh, it always has its ups and downs, it has its challenges. And we have gone through quite a bit. But we can identify a few markers, a few points during which we began to travel south in terms of the promise of Nigeria. We can also look at a few things that have come out fairly well given the circumstances. Uh, the Nigerian story at 60 is a story of diamond in the rough. You know, you've got to polish uh, this very well. Uh, the business of beneficiation when it comes to raw materials is the most important business. Uh, if you just go to the ground and dig up a piece of rock, it will not glitter. But it is the process that makes it truly diamond that, that matters. Uh, and so in Nigeria, we are faced with a situation where we started out with promise, uh, but let's bear in mind that colonial rule has its own goals. And the goal of colonial domination in Nigeria was not uh, uh, Nigeria's material economic advance. It was the goal of trying to assure that you retained a certain level of domination through divide and rule. So if we have problems, if we have problems in Nigeria, the roots go back to that. But it would be foolish to continue to blame the colonials after 60 years. This is why we have to take a great deal of a blame, which comes from very poor leadership that Nigeria has had most of its history. Uh, but going back to the challenges created by colonial rule, and to see that the early leaders of Nigeria managed much better than today's leaders of Nigeria to circumnavigate those problems created by the nature of colonialism. Let me give my traditional uh, uh, show of how Nigeria began to overcome colonial burdens. Colonial domination of Nigeria was driven primarily by the need for industrialization in Europe. Don't forget that Nigeria, or areas that became Nigeria, were in commercial engagement with Europe for hundreds of years before colonial rule. Of course, the slave trade was one form of uh, abuse to get the benefit out of uh, Africa, the impact on Africa still remains of that terrible, terrible thing that went on for hundreds of years 
Uh, we have our part of the blame, those of us who sold our brethren out. Uh, but be whatever it may be, the, the Europeans were not interested in colonial uh, domination until the Industrial Revolution. They needed raw materials for industry in Europe. But the bottom line is that they did not industrialize Africa. They did not industrialize Nigeria. At independence, there was hardly any factory in Nigeria. If you take away federated motor industries in Apapa and uh, Nigerian breweries to just put some water into uh, 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 malted barley or whatever and give us beer, there was no industrialization in Nigeria. So the founding fathers of Nigeria recognized that part of their major challenge was industrializing the country. The first quick move was made by the Premier of Western Region, Chief Obafemi Aolo, when he set up what is today's industrial, uh, Ikeja Industrial Estate. Again, in the competitive communalism that marked the early days of independence in Nigeria or nationalism in Nigeria, a phenomenon that Howard Wolpe and Robert Melson describe very, very well in their book on modernization in Nigeria, this phenomenon of competing ethnic nationalities or who will most bring progress to its people drove industrialization. The Sadauna responded with Kakuri Industrial Estate in Kaduna. Uh, uh, Michael Okbara responded with double, you know, Aba, Transamadi in Port Harcourt, and industrialization took off in Nigeria and was going very rapidly. Um, military rule, in my opinion, was where the trouble began majorly. Not started, there were problems. The nature of civilian contestations uh, that created the hegemony uh, instincts and all of those problems. I created uh, a wet year in Western Nigeria, those contented uh, 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 elections. The uh, challenges that flowed from that that led to a, a group of young military officers who probably didn't see tomorrow as clearly as they should have, but were imbued with the idea of this, these uh, politicians are making a mess of this country, and they started the worst part of travel for Nigeria. The convergence of command control military rule, which destroyed Nigeria's federalism, and oil, I call it the dangerous alchemy of soldiers and oil, which made the government at the center have resources that people abandoned, thinking about taxation in real sense, which gives people control. You know, uh, you know, as a young boy growing up in Lagos, I can tell you that one of the great escapes if you wanted to see Nigeria, you, you, you went to Mushi, the uh, area around Luth, and see people escaping tax people, chasing them in western region into the territory of Lagos. Uh, all of those were abandoned because of this dangerous alchemy of soldiers and oil. Um, what Professor George Obioso would describe as the politics of precarious balancing, which helped Nigeria to keep steering, even in foreign policy. You knew that some parts of Nigeria, some nationality groups, had greater affinity with the Arabs. You knew that others that were more Christian had greater affinity with Israel. And so you had to balance things. And uh, George calls it the politics of precarious balancing. That was abandoned by the military for the politics of domination. That politics of arrogance and domination has crippled Nigeria and brought it to where it is today. And so moving forward, Nigeria has to unwind the damage that military rule uh, did to it. And I, give you, I can give you lots of examples. In the, in the 60s, the nature of the structure of the federation was that there were two tiers of uh, federating units, the subnationals and the federal government. i tell you a particular story I've told many, many times, told to me by the man himself. You know, one of my great mentors was Dr. Pius Okibo, who was the first uh, economic advisor to the prime minister of Nigeria. And he told me this story uh, years ago about um, how steel, how Nigeria missed the steel age, how the federal government thought that steel was important for the country going forward. And so uh, it wanted to build a steel mill. It did its studies. Where, was, where, where were there iron ore deposits? Where was coal deposited? It made a decision about where to locate this steel uh, complex. And then at a meeting of the Nigeria Economic Council, which was made up of the uh, Prime Minister, the Premiers, and the technical people, Prime Minister Tafawa Balewa introduced the subject, and the Premiers objected. I said, this is not federalism. If you, as a federal government, will build a factory, you must build one in every region. And uh, 
Prime Minister Balewa said, sorry, the factor endowments, the resources available to us does not make it reasonable to build a steel mill in every region. And the Premier has objected, and they had a long, quarrelsome conversation. After a while, uh, Balewa asked the technocrats to leave the room. It was just the politicians. And after quite a bit of deliberation, they asked the technocrats back, and Balewa announced that Nigeria would now build a steel mill in every region. Uh, Dr. Kibo says he looked up in, you know, in horror, like, what are you saying? And I said, Balewa looked away. When the meeting finished, he was walking towards uh, the Prime Minister and said to him, Mr. Prime Minister, and he said, yes, yes, Dr. Akibo, Dr. Akibo, the powerful premiers have had their say, we will have our way. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, what will be our way? Said Balewa said, Dr. Akibo, we will do nothing. That's how Nigeria missed the steel age. Because, but that was the spirit of contestations in a federation. With the dangerous alchemy of soldiers and oil, uh, we went a different track. And so what happened? The powerful had their way. By 1976, under Obasanjo, um, a new um, structure hit the Federation as a third tier of government became a federating unit that could participate in the um, uh, uh, fiscal uh, uh, transfer system. Uh, with the local governments introduced, the more powerful began to get more and more local governments into their um, neighborhoods, if you will. And so, whereas the convenience of local governments, which in the 50s and 60s was for the regions to create whatever was convenient for them, that was jettisoned. By that time, however, the South, regions in the South had created many more local governments than there were in the North, because it was inconsequential to the federal arrangement. Within a few short years under the military, uh, we had a situation where there were nearly twice as many local governments in what was the old northern Nigeria relative to the southern Nigeria. Now, what this means is that in terms of federal allocation of resources, most of the revenues of a country was traveling south. But you see, that provides an opportunity to give Nigeria a lesson for what matters. Nigerians keep fighting about sharing money, revenues, oil money, this, 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 with more revenues flowing to the north. What has been the result? The result is that northern Nigeria has become much poorer. Why? Because wealth is not created by revenues. Wealth is created by production. History teaches us so much about this. You look at Spain uh, and compare Spain to the low countries of the Benelux countries, uh, uh, Switzerland and co. Spain was the one that had lots of revenues coming from the colonial conquests, the conquistadores, Export, expat, expatriations and expatriations. But what happened? The Spanish elite behaved like Nigeria's elite is currently behaving, consumed like they were drunkards, you know, the fanciest of things, and a couple of generations down the line, its next generation had not received the investments that were required to produce and stay wealthy. So, as Spain became poorer, Switzerland and co. became much more wealthy countries. That's the sad part of the point that I would like to get to about the quality of public conversation. In public conversation, and, and, and Ruben, I told you about a conversation I had with uh, Nasser El Rufai in your presence at the Femin of Patito's gang about 20 years or so ago, I don't remember exactly when. And I was telling him this same thing. And I said, look, the young nine-year-old boy in the north who is not getting the education he should get. And I just finished the conversation with now late uh, 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 Waziri Mohammed, And I said to him, look, Waziri was telling me about his father's experience as, I think, Commissioner for Education or something, Kano. He said, if those kids don't get the education that they desire and require today, as nine-year-olds, they can go and beg and get money and get some food. At 40, they will not be able to go and do that and they will have no skills to use to produce. You know what they will do? They will find guns and take it away from people. Today, the elite cannot travel from Kaduna to Abuja by road, because what I predicted 20 years ago has come to pass. 
This is a tragedy of not having people who think run a country. Mm. You're thinking short terms. Ah, we can put money in our pocket. That is not how a nation is built. You think long term. You project. You look at the experience of other nations. And that's how things went wrong in Nigeria. I mean, I can go on for two hours on this subject, but you, I think you may need to <laughs> I'm stop gonna me come in so now. you can ask other questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come in now. That anecdote you shared about the steel mill is nothing short of depressing, quite frankly. And it just creates a different impression on that general saying of, oh, this is such a failure to our founding fathers who had this unified vision for Nigeria. Apparently not. And I read an article recently by Simon um, Kolawale of this day saying the same thing, that our founding fathers were not thinking in terms of nationhood. So I want to raise with you that um, old Greek proverb that a society grows great when old men plant trees, knowing they will never sit in the shade. How does that apply to Nigeria? Well, the, the, the statement is absolutely true. Uh, uh, and that is the big challenge that we face right now. We, um, you know, a couple of years ago, a World Economic Forum was going to meet in Abuja. And the president of Nigeria at the time made a statement. I typically get upset by things that, get, that happen, and I never, I call people who can talk to these people. The president of Nigeria, good luck, Jonathan, made a statement that Nigeria is a clear example of a thriving country because it has the fastest growing private jet market in the world. And I nearly fell from my chair. And it was not a thinking statement to make. Nigeria was becoming one of the poorest countries in the world. But the nature of the Gini coefficient, the nature of the abuse of the system, was allowing a few people to get so rich and, to so, and, and not to be able to think of Nigeria 20 years from now. They thought of themselves for this moment, and they used it to buy private jets. And I thought, this is the most wrong metaphor. I tried to call everybody who could talk to him to say, please don't repeat that statement. And I suspect that he may have heard it because he then and repeated the statement 24, 48 <laughs> hours later, at which point I gave up completely. You see, um, you must think long term if you are a leader. Leadership is sacrificial giving of oneself for the advance of the common good of all in the understanding that your own profit is immortality. Your real profit comes from when you harvest what Abraham Lincoln continues to harvest today. Abraham Lincoln was considered a madman in his time, but, but nearly 200 years after him, books are being written every year, several books, about transforming leadership and what it means and the example of Abraham Lincoln as a transformational leader. And that is what old men do. They sit and they look at tomorrow. They don't look at this moment because if you are looking at this moment, you will not be able to do the things that will make a country work. The Chinese are particularly gifted in this. The Chinese think in 100-year terms. Many people think in terms of next week, and that is their undoing and prevents them. Even with corporate life, that is the same thing. Many corporate leaders are looking at the next annual return. How will I be judged uh, before I retire in five years, in three years? But the companies that have thrived are the companies whose leaders looked at many more years ahead, and even if it meant the company not doing as well as it could in their, on their watch, but turning out to be a greater company. Those are the corporate leaders that win through history. Those are the ones that are authentic leaders. And, and that's what our country has lacked. It has lacked authentic leadership. And part of the reason is the leadership selection process that we have put in place in our country. So that it's all about transactions. Um, uh, a, a great American political scientist who's probably one of the greatest authors around the subject of leadership from a, a political science point of view, uh, James McGregor Barnes, uh, uh, talks about the idea of transforming leadership. And transforming leadership uh, is in contradistinction from uh, transactional leadership. Nigerian leadership is fundamentally transactional. I will build Second Niger Bridge for you if you vote for me. We will give you water. And in fact, in the 60s, if they gave you water and the next election you didn't vote for them, they went and removed the pipes <laughs> going to your home. So those kinds of transactional leadership orientations don't a nation build. 
What builds a nation is a passion for the future, a thought about the children of the children of the children of those not yet born, okay. and what good will come from their uh, ways. Okay. Uh, okay. And I can tell you that one of the best examples for me is Nigeria's revenue allocation formula, which has been a tragedy, big okay. tragedy for our country. Okay. Um, 18 years from now, oil would have become a non-economic value of significance. And then everybody's eye will open in Nigeria. But 25, 30 years ago, people like me began to say, look, we must treat oil revenue as a windfall from the sky okay. that we should not okay. allow to damage okay. how we okay. develop Prof, our country, you can hear me. but should be saved significantly. Prof, if you can hear me, the Independence Day parade is on, so okay. the Vice President is already around, so we'd just like to take that and take proceedings from the Eagle Square in Abuja. All right. We'll come back to you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Uh, proceedings are still going on there at uh, Eagle Square. You could see uh, the parade uh, going on. The Vice President, uh, Professor Yamio Shibajo, is there. We'll just quickly come back to you, uh, Professor uh, Tommy. I mean, you said a lot. I mean, I, I like the picture you paint about who a true leader should be. Uh, somebody once said, leaders are like artists. It's when you die and you go, your work becomes really valuable. Yes. Not when you are alive. But you made a very important input that I want to explore, that we don't talk about in Nigeria. That was an input made by Professor Corrado Gini, you know, the, the man that talked a lot about the Gini coefficient. And how can we balance out the Gini coefficient in Nigeria? Because it's always skewed and it's indicative of many factors, the rentier system, I can go on and on and on, and the perceived inefficiencies that herald our nation. Yeah. But, but you know, we have a remarkable example, Brazil. Brazil used to be one of the worst cases of the Gini index, yeah. uh, where the bottom decile and the top decile, the gap was so huge in Brazil, and we saw the consequence for Brazil. Uh, a long time, for a long time in Brazil, the insecurity was such that if you were a ghetto boy and your football talents showed and you were hired by Santos or somebody, the first money you earned was usually paid as ransom for your mother. They go and kidnap your mother and you use the money to pay her ransom. And I used to joke in Nigeria, this thing will begin to happen in Nigeria. Not two or three years after I said it, uh, what's his name in Bielsa, the football player? His mother got kidnapped. And I said, you see, there is nothing new under the sun. You can predict societies that are not well run, what the outcomes will be. Um, but how did Brazil eventually begin to deal with those kinds of things? There was this time when security was so bad in Brazil where the rich were fantabulously wealthy and the poor were mendaciously 
deprived. And you got to a point, the rich to go to work had to travel in a motorcade of security men in front, security men behind. Even inside the car he was traveling, they'll be in front and beside, he will sit in the middle. That's how bad he got. I actually watched a BBC documentary some years ago about that. You know, um, at a point it was just not enough. They started flying in from their suburb uh, uh, palaces by helicopter onto the rooftop of their office blocks in Sao Paulo. Now, what happened in Brazil? It get to a point, Brazil was a permanent country of great potential that never seemed to arrive where it was potentially supposed to arrive at. And um, the scholars, Brazilian scholars, generally all became part of a movement in international political economy study that was called dependency theory. They were called the dependistas. And one of the most famous of the dependistas, in fact, their father, in many ways, was this, uh, a sociologist, economist, uh, Henrique Fernando Cardoso. And Cardoso uh, was at the Economic Commission for Latin America and led the great wave of thought. I got the chance as a graduate student in the late 70s to be at a conference where Cardoso made a presentation. And I recall something I said to him, and he remembered it when I met him after he finished being president of Brazil. And I said to him, Professor Cardoso, um, your thesis on dependency is fantastic, but for me it is elegant theorizing with no redemptive value. I thought he must have was this precocious young man. Um, well, fast forward. Uh, the military leave power in Brazil. Cardoso returns from exile uh, in Chile and becomes foreign minister of, of Brazil. And then um, when um, things were so bad in Brazil, the lifespan, the joke was the lifespan of the finance minister in Brazil was three months because inflation was out of the roof. In fact, I can tell you a story of, uh, of, of being in Sao Paulo during that season. There used to be a joke that prices could change two, three times while you were inside the store shopping. But the price when you enter the shop and the price when you are paying might be the third change or something like that. The situation was that bad. Uh, 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 you could get drunk walking on the streets of Sao Paulo uh, from the amount of alcohol in the air from the gas emissions because they couldn't afford petrol. They were, to, were trying experimenting with what they call gas hall and everywhere smelled alcohol. Then, Cardoso, as foreign minister, had to make a speech at the UN. When he arrived at New York, and uh, was about to go off to uh, make this speech, uh, General Assembly speech, uh, and Cardoso told this story himself. Uh, uh, um, he got a call from the president and said, uh, uh, Professor Cardoso, how would you like to be finance minister? And Cardoso thought, Oh my goodness, why? Why now? Why this question? They said, Mr. President, I'm about to make a very important speech. Uh, can we speak tomorrow about this matter? And, and uh, the president said, OK, let's talk tomorrow. And Cardoso went, made his UN speech, came back to his hotel room, and the, the phone rings, and it's his wife. And his wife calls him three times. And any man knows that when your wife calls you three times, you are in serious trouble. So, on the third ring, Paris Cardoso said to his wife, sweetheart, what have I done again? And she says, how can you possibly accept to be finance minister? He said, I have not done any such thing. He said, you have not? It's been announced. You are the new finance minister. Anyway, talking about leadership, Enrique Fernando Cardoso, father of the dependistas, returns to Brasilia and decides that what matters is not Cardoso's reputation as a scholar, what matters is the future of Brazil. So he paneled a group of bright young Brazilian economists, several of whom came from Milton Friedman's uh, University of Chicago program. What did they end up with? The exact opposite of everything that Cardoso has stood for in his intellectual life. Whereas Cardoso's friends, like Osvaldo Sonkel and others, were talking about selective delinking from international capitalism, these young boys argued for Brazil to integrate into the international capitalist system 
and grow off of globalization. Cardoso, according to his promise, acquiesced. Inflation came to a screeching halt in Brazil. Brazil began to grow, and things began to normalize. Of course, they literally said, Cardoso, come and be president. And we got a president, Cardoso, who did a pretty good job stabilizing things in Brazil. And then he was succeeded by Inácio Lula da Silva, who the trade unionists brought in a sense of the people into how this was, was, was done. And we got these conditional cash transfers that proved to be phenomenal. Also familiar. People were going out of poverty in their millions every day in Brazil. I can say without any equivocation that I was impressed enough to try and smuggle that into the APC manifesto, into the roadmap that this government was supposed to implement. Fairly being poorly implemented, as you can see, riddled with all kinds of problems and all kinds of things. But that was where the concept came from. The Bossa Familia system was significant in beginning to bridge the Gini coefficient uh, in Brazil. So we can do it not just following the Lula da Silva model, but a Nigerian adaptation that creates economic growth, that is anchored on what I like to, and, 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 and the, uh, um, uh, the Chinese economist uh, uh, Justin Lin very much uh, travels a, a path similar to that in his, in his uh, 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 recommendation, anchor that with um, an economic development strategy that's based on latent comparative advantage, where industrial policy essentially anchors some sectors in which we have, lit, uh, which we have uh, uh, factor endowment that we can develop the value chains into global value chains that we can be competitive in, and not the kind of impulse of industrialization grand cover of tariffs that led to the permanent infant industrial system that we have in our country. Those well, will create jobs, and those will lead to a bridge in this Gini index. Well, Prof, many years ago, you talked about Nigeria being a recursive state, a country that takes one step forward, uh, two steps backwards. Now, certainly, there must have been some bright moments in the evolution of the country post-independence. Today is Independence uh, Day, uh, 68th Independence Day. Well, since morning, we've all been lamenting. We've been uh, talking about how others have been able to do it. But are there some bright spots in this our journey that we need to use as some kind of foundation for going forward? There, there are bright spots. There are bright spots. Let us be very fair to ourselves here. Uh, some terrible mistakes uh, resulted in a civil war. But the way Nigeria ended that civil war, in spite of what many may say, is probably uh, a, a global first. Uh, many civil wars uh, um, take generations to end. Nigeria's civil war, with the leadership, extraordinary leadership, of General Yakub Gowan, um, ended on this famous note of no victor, no vanquished. It's not an easy thing to say. It might sound trite today, but it's not an easy thing to say. And to have the heart that really believes in it, because Jeragawan believed in it, implementation may not have been uh, uh, as he intended or desired, but he believed in it. And he had a group of really capable people who were committed to it. I don't know if you read any of the things that um, Alaji Ahmed Joda uh, 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 has been writing. In fact, this morning, uh, I think in no more than an hour, I am hosting him and about 70-something Nigerian elders to talk through this journey uh, and to say, look, let's be reconciled to one another and look to a new future because the potentials of Nigeria are extraordinary. So anyway, the um, outcome of the civil war it's followed by the so-called three R's, um, you know, reconciliation, reconstruction, rehabilitation, and all of that. Nine years later, Dr. Alex Ifainchuku Ekweme, who came out of that war, lost most of what he had. His friends in Lagos has, had preserved his properties in Lagos, had become vice president of this country. 
there are not many places in human history with that kind of record. And this is the Nigeria that we can build on. I believe that as we stand today, the biggest challenge of Nigeria for me is that its intellectuals have retreated. Its middle class have become complicit because they feel that they can construct their um, isolation wards, that they can build their own local governments, they can buy SUVs to overcome the vibrance of intellectual Nigeria in the 70s that saw the ABU academics dominate um, the new Nigerian. The Legacy Battle Axis take over uh, uh, um, the Lagos Ibadan press area. That needs to return. The Nigerian middle must take back their country. And we've been talking about the constitution. People say, ah, what can you do? National Assembly will not do it. It is against their interest. Italy has, has just slashed the size of its National Assembly. They can afford it much better than us. But we say, what can we do? National Assembly will not implement it. We can do something. At some point this morning, I am going to announce a broad national constitution review committee on behalf Prof, of the NCF. Prof, sorry to interrupt you. The president, uh, President Buhari, is just arriving at Igu Square in Abuja. We'll just take uh, a part of that, and then we'll come back to you for oh, wrap oh, up this right. conversation. OK. Well, Igu Square there on the screen, uh, with the president of Nigeria arriving uh, for the 60th independence anniversary of Nigeria. Dignitaries, may please take your seats. Thank you. The national salutes that heralded the arrival of the special guest of honor, the reviewing officer, President, Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Excellency Muhammad Buhari, GCFR, over.
the parade commander, Lieutenant Colonel Mukhtar Sani Daroda, marches towards the presidential days to give the essence of today's ceremony and the officers and guards on parade to Mr. President and to diligently seek Mr. President's permission uh, to inspect the officers and guards on parade. We shall we see that shortly. Yeah, 2020. Well, Independence Day uh, celebration there at the Eagle Square in Abuja. And the President Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria is already there marking uh, the commencement of the uh, parade, Independence Day parade. Well, we'll still keep an eye on that, but we'll return to our Lagos studio now where we've been having a conversation with Professor Pat Utomi. Prof? Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you very much uh, for staying with us. Uh, yeah. but so you were talking was, about an initiative. Right. That you were going I'm to launch that this, this morning. This morning, we are announcing a constitution review and drafting committee on behalf of the uh, NCF, the National Consultative Front. Uh, this constitution review and drafting committee will be chaired by Mr. Olisa Wakoba. It will include some former members of the National Assembly. It will include some senior lawyers. The NBA is actually sending formal representatives. The Association of uh, APBN, uh, Professional uh, uh, Bodies of Nigeria, former representative Nasima, former representative. And we are taking Nigerians across the board uh, who have shown citizenship and have been involved in constitution making. And the primary charge to this uh, group is to take the outcome of the Jonathan Conference the outcome of the Obasanjo conference, and new thinking, especially the new thinking that emphasizes a return, which is my preference, I must admit, to a parliamentary, a Westminster parliamentary form of government that emphasizes lean, trin, mean thinking government and emphasizes the principle of subsidiarity or decentralization of public authority to be closer to the people and to provide us a draft constitution that we can go around this country and have uh, town hall meetings around and present for a formal process, perhaps requiring the National Assembly to transmute into a constituent assembly with additional members to pass this document so that Nigeria can have a people's constitution. Uh, I am also hosting this morning uh, a meeting of the Nigerian elders forum, as I mentioned earlier, that will put its head together on where did we begin to go wrong. Some of my personal views is the death of patriotism. You don't build a nation without patriots. And this runs across the board from business, the complicit middle, as I call the middle class today, through to the youth of our country. Look, I can tell you I've been chairman of the board of a bank. We don't have banking in Nigeria. With what we have, this country will not make economic progress. So we have to completely shatter this thing and build a new banking system. Can you imagine that the, 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 a development bank said to me that, ah, your project is fantastic, but you see you're a politically exposed person. Managing director of a development bank in Nigeria is 10 times more politically exposed than me. I have not been near public office. I have not had any government contract in 40 years. And the person who is appointed by politicians over with, without any process says to me that I'm politically exposed. It's the kind of nonsense that goes on in Nigeria. So we need to build patriotism in even our commercial players because their conduct is preventing the growth and development that our country uh, 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 requires. We need a new kind of citizenship. We've talked before on this program uh, uh, of the hierarchy of members of a society from idiots to tribesmen, to citizens. We need to build a new citizens of participating people engaged in rational public conversation, not insulting one another. And from out of these citizens, a philosopher king who provides wisdom that sees tomorrow 100 years more clearly and guides how these conversations lead us to that tomorrow that we envision. We need to be able to get civil society re-energized and engaged with Nigeria. Right now, between centripetal and centrifugal forces, 
The truth of the matter is that our country is tearing apart, and we need to reverse the curse and wow. reverse the course. You heard me? Curse and course. A nice play on words together. there. Well, but the president says, in spite of everything, we must remain very optimistic. And there's no doubt the two initiatives you are working on, beginning from today, uh, will also give a lot of people hope. Thank you very much, Professor Tomi, for joining us on The Morning Show. It's a great pleasure. special occasion. Glad I could join you.